and we want to invite on Amjad Mahmood Khan. Uh, Amjad, assalamu alaikum. Peace be on to you. Peace be on so for, everyone. Since our listeners know, Amjad is the president of the Public Affairs Department of the Afghan Muslim Community, the, or the National Secretary, rather. He's a former Harvard Law graduate and also president of the Ahmadiyya Muslim Lawyers Association as well. So he has a lot of stuff and a lot of duties on his plate. And uh, we kind of just want to jump right into it. Um, we know that there's a lot of turmoil across the country and that there's a lot of issues that are really heating up. Um, and in your capacity of the, as you know, National Secretary of the Public Affairs Department for the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community in North America, or in the United States, rather, there's a lot of different activities that, that have been going on. And could you kind of talk about the Supreme Justice series that the Ahmadiyya Muslim Community has been holding and the inspiration behind that? Certainly. I mean, we all um, have been following the um, incredibly tense moments that have been broadcast on television, all over social media, in the United States in our cities, in our streets, in America, um, where the issue of uh, racism has now become at the forefront of our national conversation and national conscience. Now, these are issues that have been plaguing our society for, for decades, if not centuries. Um, but recent events um, have become... Uh, so palpable uh, in terms of the hearing images uh, of the cases of George Floyd, Jacob Blake, Breonna Taylor, and so many others. So in, on Memorial Day, when we all observed that unbelievable uh, video and the, the cruel and heinous m uh, murder of George Floyd um, at the hands of a, of a member of law enforcement, um, we as a community, as an American Muslim community that's celebrating our centennial year, that's been in the United States for 100 years um, and has been trying to champion the cause of justice for all, um, felt that it was necessary to do something uh, on a grassroots level and also to raise awareness. And um, the community quickly galvanized and put on programming and uh, a letter-writing campaign in which uh, we focus on informing our leaders and lawmakers about some of the issues that we feel um, uh, invite grave injustice to people of color in the United States. And, and so we've been focused on that, those efforts in a systematic way. We've had a number of uh, good forums and discussions and conferences around it, inviting a panel of experts um, who really study these issues from a variety of lenses. And... Um, We've improved our own education and understanding. Um, when I say our own, I mean people who may not recognize uh, all of the injustices that have been committed against black Americans, particularly um, particularly in the context of policing, that it's an education for us to learn about the history, learn about the data, learn about the systemic failures, and to correct those. Um, but it requires person education. So those are some of the things broadly that we've been working on. That's great. And one of the things I want to kind of get a better understanding is that the theme for a lot of these series, a lot of these events, has been the phrase uh, supreme justice. And so I'm just curious for the listeners who may just be wondering why we use that phrase or why we use those words. Um, what's the significance behind that? Is there some inspiration from the Quran? Um, how did we? How did the Ahmadiyya Muslim community come up with that phrase? Yeah. So um, when you think Supreme Justice, you might think you know the Supreme Court, right, in the United States. But uh, the way this came about was the community, of course, is guided by the Khalifa of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, the international spiritual leader, His Holiness Hazrat Mirza Masrur Ahmad, who who um, leads tens of millions of Ahmadiyya Muslims worldwide. And, of course, we seek his spiritual guidance um, and his advice on all matters. And when the video, uh, when he saw the video, um, he, he viewed it intently and was uh, very disturbed by the images. And, um, of course, we know that um, there has been a, a movement in America, uh, a robust movement of Black Lives Matter, um, a term that was you know, coined years ago but has now become a social movement. Um, and the idea behind supremacy of justice was, from an Islamic vantage point, um, the only thing that is supreme, 
right? The only thing that should be supreme is the idea of justice for everyone. Um, and this concept really comes um, from the Quran, and it comes from the example of the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. So he famously, in his final sermon, um, mentioned that a white person is not superior to a black person, or an Arab, Arab is not superior to a non-Arab. So what he's talking about is superiority, and there is no superiority of skin color or race. Rather, um, the, the idea of, of supremacy of, of one's race is rejected and refuted in Islam. Um, the only thing that is, quote-unquote, supreme is Allah's justice and the, the quest. And Allah's justice in the Islam, justice means the, the system of fairness and a, and a principle of fairness that applies to everyone, regardless of who they are, that is based on you know, proper guidance and evidence and, and um, you know, the truth. And so we felt like in order to convey that Islamic concept, uh, we should uh, launch this campaign, Supreme Justice, which, um, you know, sort of rethinks how we in, in the United States have thought about justice from a racial lens and, and focus in on how um, the idea of justice should be above uh, ev- everything else. And um, that ju- that system of justice should be inclusive of all people, including people of color. So it really comes from that uh, uh, from that um, sort of Quranic basis, among other things. So you know that's that's very interesting, uh, Amjad, that you had mentioned. You know uh, the events that had taken place. You know the the programs and 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 kind of schemes that the Ahmadi Muslim community had, had then launched in response to, you know, try to foster these discussions and, and, and foster an understanding. Um, and you also mentioned, you know, His Holiness, the the Khalifa of Islam, observing these events. And so, you know, in light of all of the stuff that we've seen, was there any specific uh, guidance or, uh, you know, specific um, reactions or even sentiments um, that His Holiness may have shared um, that would be beneficial or that may have, you know, incited us as a community to then decide to kind of put these events together and, and steer the discussion in a certain way? Yes, he, he's made um, uh, many statements uh, about this in the past, and in, in, in light of this particular uh, event of, uh, that happened on Memorial Day with George Floyd, he actually had specific guidance. And so I wanted to share some of that um, and I appreciate you raising that. I mean, as I mentioned, he talked about the idea of supremacy of justice. He also talked about the idea of making sure that innocent lives matter. What that means is, you know, innocent lives is inspired by the Quranic teaching that the murder of even one innocent person is akin to killing the whole of humanity, right? So, and if you save one person, it's as if you save all of humanity. So, this Quranic concept elevates the, the idea of innocence. But, but he also said in terms of, of, of innocence is it, it does not mean when you say innocent lives that those who commit low-level crimes right, or who may be forced into error due to the circumstances they've grown up in, where they have been denied opportunities and justice, are not deemed innocent. What His Holiness has said is that they are forced to commit such crimes sometimes for economic reasons to feed their families or to exist even, just to persist in their own livelihood. And then they, therefore they're very much still innocent. And the only people who aren't innocent, who are not innocent, are those who have the power or wealth and use it to persecute, to brutalize and perpetrate grave injustice and who deny people their rights. And then he went on to say that the very definition and standard of someone who is not innocent is that he violates the sanctity of life, and a prime example of this is a member of law enforcement who abuses his power to mercilessly place his knee on the neck of a man, an armed black man, and refuses to remove it for almost nine minutes, even as the defenseless man, George Floyd, repeats, I can't breathe. So, so in, in, this, uh, in this construct, when we talk about the supremacy of justice, when we talk about innocent lives matter, what we're saying is that the idea of innocence and guilt in the U.S. criminal justice system has been defined in a way that it really disproportionately impacts people of color, and then people just assume the system is correct, 
And then if someone has been has been labeled a criminal in the system, then that gives free license to persecute them. This is un-Islamic, categorically. And this is what His Holiness is reminding us. I, I think that's so interesting because, you know, as recently we had a discussion, uh, in my past role as a prosecutor, I saw a lot of these issues really front on in terms of the idea that in the United States we have this system in where we're all trying to obtain justice. But unfortunately, through that justice, we see statistics that clearly show that justice isn't being meted out, that there is some type of inequality that's causing people that are black Americans to face so much more scrutiny under the criminal justice system than they are in, you know, in, 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 than other people are. And I think Islam really provides an interesting solution because, as we know, in before Islam was brought into place, the Arab culture at that time was a place where, you know, racism and slavery and the superiority of the Arab race was pretty prevalent. Yet they were able to essentially transform their, their time period into a place in where um, the first person to give the call to prayer was in was an African slave, was a person of color. And yet here in the United States, it took us so much time to have an African, a black president. And even if even though we've had a black president, we don't see that same representation across government. We don't see that same type of, you know, that, that feeling that, okay, we really conquered that hurdle. So the question is, how is Islam able to fight that racism that America doesn't seem to have been able to have conquered. So much so that individuals like Malcolm X, who, you know, was such a staunch racist in the opposite end of the spectrum, was able to, you know, when he converted to Islam and he and did Hajj, he had a whole transformation that he saw that, wow, I guess, you know, white people aren't the devil. And racism maybe isn't something that is ingrained in our society. So what what is it about Islam that allows for that to happen, that we might are be lacking here or that we can learn from here in the United States? Yeah, it's a very good question, Osama, and, and your uh, your experience as a prosecutor rightly points out some of the discrepancies in the U.S. criminal justice system. As far as Islam is concerned, um, Islam prescribes a beautiful, comprehensive blueprint to achieve, you know, just relations in society. And it's not simply about justice or the idea of justice from a legal sense. That is something, of course, Islam prescribes. But if you look at the seminal verse of the Quran, which is in Surah Al-Nahal, which is chapter 16, verse 91, it says that Allah requires you to abide by justice, to treat with grace, and to give like the giving of kin to kin. Um, So this very famous verse of the Quran, by the way, this, this verse of the Quran is recited every Friday in the Friday sermon in Arabic, all over the world. So you can see this verse is recited millions of times, if not billions of times. Um, And why is this verse recited? Because the translation is is saying here that there are three stages of human relations, right? There's the, 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 the minimum stage, or the first stage of the basic safeguard in society, which is Adal, absolute justice. That means that's a floor. That means every single human being has to have that sense of justice, that accessibility to justice. And in Islam, there are some very specific requirements for that, uh, without getting into the niceties of Islamic you know, fiqh and law, which I can, but for purposes of, of, uh, of summarizing this succinctly, um, you know, for example, the evidentiary requirement, the witness requirement in Islam is much more rigorous than the U.S. system. Um, you know, the idea and the purposes behind the justice system um, are a lot more comprehensive. But that's just the minimum entry-level system, that you have to have fairness, which means you, you can even give testimony. Uh, if, if there's testimony that helps the other side and is against yourself, you should use that testimony, right? Even if it's against your own loved ones, you should testify against them, if that's in the interest of justice. This is what the Prophet Muhammad repeatedly did, even with his own daughter, who was accused of a crime, he would always, always implement and mete out a just system. But the second stage in Islam is ihsan. That's a beautiful word, and it means benevolence. It means that 
Allah just doesn't command us to exercise justice alone, but desires us to voluntarily add benevolence to the act of justice. And then that, that second stage of human relations is sign to grant someone more than his due, right? Like, so if you have something that's owed to you in a transaction, or if there's something that you need to have from a criminal matter to get justice for something that's a wrong that was done to you, that needs to be in, in retribution, in fair retribution, there should be recompense. But beyond that, you should also show kindness to the person that has been, had, uh, that has, uh, that has um, born in Jabal. That's Ihsan. And finally, the, the, the highest peak of justice in Islam is Ita is il qurba which again, a wonderful phrase that means to treat others with such grace such overwhelming benevolence as you would treat your own loved one, your own kin. This is a, what you would say, a spontaneous expression of love and care as a mother would care for her child. When a mother loves her child, she does so without any element of design, without, you know, any trace of, of you know, it's, it's just spontaneous. It's a natural outpouring, right? That's the same spontaneity that same expression of love uh, that that Islam demands for all human beings. So that that's a beautiful, you know, pinnacle concept in Islam, and all of those three stages must be in any society. That is that is really beautiful, and that it really lays out a blueprint for us here, you know, who are suffering from these issues to find a way to try to you know gain a higher version of ourselves. And I know that through the Supreme Justice series, we're trying to have those discussions and understand a little bit what's going on. So can you talk about what some of the events the Amity and Muslim community has held and who the panelists have been and kind of how the discussion's been and, and, and you know, what the progress has been in terms of what's, what's going to happen next? Our first program focused on trying to understand what now, you know, what is the next step in light of the George Floyd murder? And Obviously, we wanted to focus on the legislative uh, uh, work that's being done in Congress. Um, there's the George Floyd Policing Act, which was overwhelmingly passed by the United States House of Representatives in June. It was led by Karen Bath, a U.S. Congresswoman, uh, actually from Los Angeles. Um, and so we had her on the program, and we talked to her about the state of that bill and, and what she felt could be some immediate reform, you know, the excessive force that was used you know, outlawing things that are just sort of essential aspects of police of, of excessive policing. We also, you know, spoke to Dr. Joy DeGru about the psychology behind, you know, she, she wrote a really terrific book, Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome, where she talked about the, the systemic issues that have been rooted for centuries coming from slavery and how that those issues, that those biases pervade every aspect of the criminal justice system, and it was quite powerful to hear from her. And then we shifted gears, and we heard from Dr. Cornell West um, and uh, Dr. Tricia Rose. Um, these are prominent uh, uh, United States intellectuals who focus in on uh, policing and justice issues, and we really zeroed in on policing. And in that program, we also had a, a couple of other experts, um, Seth Stoughton, for instance, who's an expert, legal expert on policing, former police officer, and even Carmen Best, the police chief for Seattle, who recently um, retired. She uh, she was in Seattle, obviously. There's been a lot of tension. She's uh, one of the, uh, I think, the first black police chief in the city. And um, she, all of them gave very enlightening comments about the subject. And Osama, one of the things that, that came out of it was just understanding how you quantify injustice in the policing system, right? I mean, everyone should know that black people are three times more likely to be killed by police than white people, right? Um, they're, they're, they're 21% more likely to endure police force, uh, you know, 20% more likely to be pulled over, you know? Um, and so, so these are just, you know, they're, they're more likely to be arrested, more likely to be convicted, more likely to be sentenced. And the incarceration, incarceration rates are pretty well understood and how they disproportionately impact people of color and particularly African Americans. So, based on those objective, that objective data, and there's been different studies, and these are all 
you know, there's the Yale study, there's the Mapping Police study, there's the Stanford studies, the Pew Research Center studies, but they all coalesce around the data I just mentioned. So given that basic level of data, then we went into the an, an analysis of what we can do, because at the same time people want reform, 73% of Americans want to keep or increase the police budget. They don't want to defund the police. So there's how do you how do you find a balanced approach to deal with excessive force? That's what we discussed. Mm, uh, that's no, that's, that's that's certainly very fascinating, and uh, I mean you know there's there's all sides of the spectrum, and it's it's imperative that we you know understand um, you know what these these root causes are you know and all sides of the spectrum so that we can move forward. Now, one of the things, Amjit, that you had mentioned earlier on is, you know, one of the initial responses that um, the Ahmadiyya Muslim community had uh, under, you know, under the directive of your office was a letter writing campaign. Um, could you share with us, you know, what was that letter writing campaign? What did it, you know, in, encapsulate? And, you know, have we seen, you know, what was, were there any results that we've seen uh, early on or, or that we're expecting? Yeah, that, that was something that um, we really wanted to do. Um, it, it was something that, in, in, in my estimation, was an incredibly important um, uh, initiative, which is, you know, we have mayors all across uh, America, and uh, everyone, when they saw the horrific images of police brutality, you know, were aghast and wanted to ensure their own communities, their own towns, their own cities um, have, you know, protocols in place to deal with um, these systemic issues, and not every city, of course, does. And so we asked, um, as all of, of, of the community members, which who, of course, are citizens of the United States, in the thousands to write letters to their mayors. And we, we had, I think, over 7,500 letters in a man, manner of two weeks. And it went, they, you know, people wrote to their individual mayors, uh, members of Congress, and so forth. And we received a lot of responses to those letters, a lot of mayors who were very much engaged and appreciated the concerns that were registered. And the concerns were basically explaining as American Muslims living in America for, you know, as a community for 100 years, we, we are very concerned about the state of affairs in terms of justice being for all, which is what America strives for. And I'll give you one example. Like we sent a, a letter to a mayor in um, in Salt Lake County, I think it's the city Cottonwood Heights, if I remember it correctly. Very small town. I think it just has, you know, 20, 30,000 people. And, um, you know, that mayor didn't know who we were, but we wrote, you know, someone some, someone in the community wrote a letter. And um, he responded right away, like within, uh, within 24 hours, saying he was so moved by the fact that uh, a Muslim, American Muslim community is registering their concern in this way. And he sought a meeting and he sought... He was very much sympathetic to the issues and, and admitted that he had a largely white city and he wanted to learn about how to, you know, address these issues. So there's and that's just one example of many other mayors who responded. So I think it's an effective strategy to use the civic process and engage those who are in positions of power to force them, quote unquote, to act with justice. I think that's that's important to work within the system to change the system. I think that's a really, you know, a beautiful way to present it. And I think for a lot of people that are listening in, they might wonder, okay, so how do Muslims respond to this injustice? What is the solution? Is the solution to go protest? Is the solution to write letters? Are letters going to really make a difference? I mean, what is the Islamic way of making a change in a society or in a country when a Muslim, and we've talked in so many other episodes, is obligated to be loyal to their country, it's obligated to, you know, follow the leaders within their country, to be like the camels that are mentioned in the Holy Quran and follow in a straight line. How does a Muslim then kind of, I guess, combat that country or combat that those wrong ideologies while still being loyal to their nation? Yeah, that's, that's a very critical question. And, uh, you know, our community very much has guidance on that. I mean, Obviously, we know that protests have, have, a, have an effect. It may be a little bit limited um, uh, effect, but they do have an effect. Um, and people individually, in order to express their frustration, shouldn't, can and should legitimately you know, um, make their, their points of view heard you know, as a matter of protest. So there's, 
there's no issue with any individual member of our community, for instance, and many have, going out and joining protests that are peaceful and ensuring that, you know, that, that, uh, that that there's as long as as of course there's no illegality and there's no violence in those protests, but that registering their concern in that way. But when I say limited effect, I mean if you just take a look at the effect of marches or protests, they do have they do seem to to uh, appear to have an effect. But on the margins, they also create and sometimes further tensions, right? So because there's a polarized environment. I mean, America has never been more divided. Um, as Abraham Lincoln said, a house divided will not stand, right? So we have to be very mindful of of what it is we're trying to achieve. And if we're really trying to fix systemic problems, structural uh, structures of discrimination, then we need to understand how we can mobilize to actually create that change. And, and that requires affecting change in a more astute way by, you know, exercising and mobilizing um, our, our our civic and democratic, you know, rights and and individuals working to exercise those rights, and that of course is voting, that's registering concerns like letter writing and bringing real change. And I think meeting with state officials, national officials, considering ways to 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 force people to act with justice within the system, uh, even privately taking private meetings, these I think have a more enduring impact uh, on balance than just merely protesting. Um, so, so I think that's been the curtain call for our community is to really focus in on uh, robust ways to, to achieve change. Agreed. I feel like, you know, we've seen all these different type of protests and where, you know, we had the, the Wall Street, the Occupy Wall Street protests. We had the protests in different countries, like in the revolution of Egypt. And we often see that, you know, the injustices that were there, the roots that are there, they don't really change from those protests. There isn't really that type of change that we need to see in society from those protests. The protests might be a type of catalyst, maybe to encourage that change, but to actually have that be the end goal, you know, that that's not how I think Islam sees it. So I think our question might be then, how has Islam been involved with, you know, the legislature or how has your department worked with the legislature currently or in the past to try to make that type of change or try to make change that we've for any injustice that we've seen? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, obviously, in accordance to Islam, our campaigns and efforts focus on, you know, looking at how to solve systemic problems. And we feel that engaging people at all levels of government, even law enforcement and other sectors, can achieve real change. And as some concrete examples of this, I mean, uh, you know, we're, you know, working on trying to, you know, look at um, the, the issue of voting, right? Because there's voter suppression and racial gerrymandering and racially motivated gerrymandering and people who are being denied the right to even vote. It's remarkable to say that in 2020, but there are efforts underway to do that, systematic efforts um, to, to, you know, quell the vote. This has this happened. Even people who are registered to vote may not be able to vote for a variety of, of harsh reasons. We saw that in Wisconsin in 2016, where, you know, tens of thousands of people who registered to vote couldn't even vote, and that affected, uh, you know, election outcomes. So we think that mobilizing people to vote on a grassroots level is important. So we created an alliance for absolute justice, which is led by the national outreach team. And basically, they're focused on trying to have our community members be poll workers, try to provide transportation to people to register vote, make our mosques into poll centers, you know, register people to vote, um, tell people to exercise their democratic rights. This is so essential, so critical, not just this year, but in all elections, in all, in all, in every cycle, because the United States is a federal system, and every precinct, precinct every city matters. Um, and sometimes just a matter of a few hundred votes or a thousand votes can change outcomes. Prosecutors can be elected out. Or sorry, DAs can be elected out. Uh, bad judges can be elected out. Um, you know, pe- people who are in positions of authority who aren't you know, trying to achieve supreme justice, um, they can be voted out. So it's very important to, to kind of work in, about de- on democratic reform. And that's what our community is squarely focused in on and zeroing in on in these coming 60 days here. So, you know, 
looking at, at all of the events that, that have tr- kind of transpired and gotten us to this point, and especially our responses, I mean, from your perspective, from your lens, you know, taking a more macro macro view, you know, is this a matter, you know, at a macro level, is this a matter simply of racism? You know, a, a white cop who wanted to kill a, you know, an unarmed or, uh, you know, an African-American man. Is this a matter of uh, poor legislation, legislation that fosters a power imbalance? I mean, you know, if we were trying to truly identify a root cause and really kind of attack and, and eliminate that root cause, where do we start? Because I understand asking for, uh, you know, updated legislation and, and writing to your local officials. But, you know, what specifically are we actually looking at when we when we do these things? Yeah, I, I think to answer the question, I think racism is a major component of what we observe as injustice in the United States and, and even globally, economic injustice, class, you know, classism as well, um, economic, you know, lack of educational opportunities, lack of representation, um, uh, you know, uh, xenophobia, um, racism, these are all, you know, fomenting, uh, you know, further divisions and rivalries in society. And that's really, really problematic. And so I would say all of the above, but the issue of racism or race generally, it doesn't, it, it's not to say that it necessarily pervades every issue, um, but it certainly uh, is, a, is, is a major issue with respect to law enforcement and policing, and it's a, it's a major issue in society generally. That, and, and, and this is just becoming manifest when you, when you look at it from an from a aspect of national security and safety of all citizens. I mean, when a nation cannot protect its own people, um, and the people who are sworn to protect can't protect everyone or don't have the resources to protect everyone or the training or the responsibility, then it, it behooves each of us to ensure that that system be fixed. And so, um, so, so racism is a, a core component to it. But there's other issues as well. It's, it's education and educational opportunities. Uh, there's health care disparities among people of color. That's really tragic. We see that coming coming forward here in, in the COVID environment where African Americans and and members of the Hispanic community are disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. And that's because of the healthcare disparities that exist and lack of health care and adequate health care access in a lot of our urban communities. And that is because of systemic issues rooted in race and class. So we have to be very clear eyed about about some of these realities, the grim realities while at the same time understanding to be prescriptive, we have to, you know, work within whatever we can achieve uh, in our system to, to create that change. I mean, we could pro- register and protest and, and, and be very vocal on the streets, uh, as some of us do, and, and that's fine. But are we also having enduring change, lasting change, right? I mean, it, Martin Luther King uh, led, a, led a, a, a very dynamic protest in, in, in the civil rights era, but it took uh, many years for some of the most important aspects of the Civil Rights Act to be passed, enacted, and then implemented. And that required a lot of work behind the scenes, outside of the streets, working with people in government to achieve that change. Just ask John Lewis, the late John Lewis, the congressman who worked for his entire life on, the, on these causes, and how much he had to achieve in Congress, and how much he had to work hard in Congress to get there. So, so I, I do think we, you know, it, it's a, it, we have to understand it's a very complex issue. There's nuance in it, and and race is in a component of it. It's not the only component, um, but it has to be understood and recognized. Hmm. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I've observed, and I think you're absolutely right, is you know, it isn't. You, you said it perfectly. It's a very nuanced issue, and you know, I think we've spent a, a fair amount of time on this episode you know, talking about, you know, trying to identify the root cause, trying to, to kind of dissect the events and um, and also dissect our responses and see, you know, how we're moving and if we're, you know, stepping in the right direction. But now switching gears a little bit, you know, one of the questions that I have is, is you know, having kind of looked at where this all kind of came from and, and where it is right now, you know, where is all this going? And what I mean by that is, you know, do you have any guidance from either your national department or from His Holiness on, 
how we can go from being a people divided through you know poor legislation, through racism, through you know socioeconomic, uh, you know uh, class dysfunction. How do we go from that to being a people united in in a cause um, for a a equal and 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 fair and just hum, human uh, society of humanity? Yeah, that's the perennial question. That's the most important question. I would say that you know just reflecting on the guidance of the spiritual leaders, the Khalifa of the Ahmadiyya Muslim community, um, you know, it, it, it takes a paradigm shift to understand, to not look at other people through the lens of their skin color. It, it, you know, you can pay lip service to that concept or you can actually act upon it. And, you know, if you think about the 1.6 billion Muslims in the world, they look to their lodestar, you know, the master prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and his example. And uh, Osama talked a little bit about some of some of what he did in his life. And, you know, it took his lifetime to, you know, to eradicate slavery. You know, it, it wasn't overnight. It, it, it was it was an evolving process. And and he made people recognize that the true worth of a human being is based on their piety, based on their conduct, not their skin color. That revolution took took um, you know, several generations to achieve. And I think if we look ahead, um, we can't just assume these problems of excessive force and policing or you know the criminal justice system being stacked against people of color and particularly black Amer- Americans will be solved in the next two months or five months or two years or ten years, really. It, it requires a, 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 a calm and collected and deliberative effort to ensure all of the, you know, structures and systems of discrimination that exist have to be eradicated. And that comes through representation. It comes through democratic movement. It comes through a kinetic energy around ensuring true representation. I mean, we talk about a black police chief there or a member of Congress there or, you know, people of color in some respect in a corporation. I mean, that's not representation. True representation is ensuring that you know, there, there isn't, you know, a generation of, of people of color who have never had educational opportunities or access or, you know, equity in the process. Um, I, I think I heard someone once say recently, it was a, it was a wonderful comment, that, you know, while, um, while uh, you know, black Americans have been seeking equality for centuries, uh, white Americans have been gaining equity during the same time, right? And, and that's a very profound statement, and it's backed up by some of the data. Um, and that, that means that we need to think through the issues of equity. We need to think through, you know, what does it mean? I mean, if, if you know, injustices that have happened in the past, should there be a, a national referendum, you know, a charter um, that, that gets put forth to recognize the grave injustices that were committed in the past against black Americans, against people of color, um, you know, there's truth and reconciliation commissions that have happened in other contexts, in other countries. Do we need something like that in the United States to come to grips with what we see around us? So I think that, that our spiritual leaders remind us of Islam's solution, and Islam's solution is the supremacy of justice, is to elevate every innocent life, is to not just view people with guilt or innocence from a criminal justice you know, system vantage point, or from the system of humanity and from looking at people who have been put in circumstances where they have been convicted of low-level crimes, you know, not, not to just perceive such people as guilty and, and casualties within the system, but as people of dignity, people of worth, who we need to fight for. We need to ensure that they are on the same level playing field as everyone else. You have to lift everyone, and to do that, you have to unite people. You unite people with love and kindness what Islam talks about, right? This high, this highest ideal, qurba, loving your fellow human being, whoever they are, as if they're your own loved ones, your own mother, your own father. That's the mindset, and it's the mindset that has to come with a sense of real urgency right now. Yeah, and that really hits it on the, the nail on the head. I mean, that idea of that love and that kindness that we see in Islam, particularly on the issue of race racism where you know 
Africans and people of color in, in that early period of Islam were integrated into society, were part of the Islamic system. Whereas here, you know, we, we may make the lip service, we may say that, yes, you know, Black Lives Matter, yes, racism is bad. But then do we really take the necessary steps to enforce that? If somebody then said to that person, okay, well, you know, we'd like to, your daughter would like to marry this black person. And your first reaction is no, just because the person's black and, and no other reason otherwise. And, you know, in Islam, that early period, we saw that the Prophet, um, peace be upon him, would, would kind of facilitate these type of marriages to show that there's an equality amongst the people and, and that that's not the viewpoint that we should have. And I think, you know, a lot of these type of changes to happen on a societal level kind of happen in a legislative way, different mechanisms to, you know, integrate uh, all of Americans so that way they're treated as Americans and they're not segregated by their color, even if it's not literal segregation or just a disparate impact of some type of segregation. And to do that, we have to vote, right? And so my next question is, what is the MDM Muslim community? You know, are there some initiatives to help with voting? We know that voting is going to be an issue with the pandemic and, and, and things of that nature. And so what is the MDM Muslim community to help combat that? Um, I, I mentioned, I alluded to the Alliance for Absolute Justice. Um, which is a, a program that we have begun on um, ensuring voter registration, working and partnering with uh, our national partners and people who are, you know, bringing attention, like, for example, the League of Women Voters and other such organizations in a nonpartisan way who are focusing in on voter registration. Um, I think we're partnering with, with these organizations to really help, you know, drive people to register to vote, to you know, on on the public affairs side, we're focusing on the census, which is being undertaken, making sure people's representation counts by filling out that questionnaire, because that shapes all of the services and everything that gets run in the United States is by census data. So to ensure there's no you know, racial disparities in that data, there's fairness built into that system, we're working on that. Um, so there, there's a variety of, of really exciting, I think, initiatives that are happening, um, you can go to absolutejustice.us and see all of it. That is great. That, that really is, you know, we want to encourage everyone, too, that's listening, Muslim or not, to make a change in our society, we really have to go out there and vote. We really have to, you know, make that change in, in the legislature and, and really kind of make that, 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 that impact in society. So, you know, as we close out the show, we want to kind of ask you to, you know, what would be your key takeaway for readers or for our listeners rather, if they want to really make a change in society and a change in themselves and fight the systematic racism that we have, what can they do? What should they do? I would say um, uh, from an Islamic vantage point, you know, to achieve supreme justice and absolute justice, requires access to the system and participation in the system. And I would say representation matters. Representation matters more than ever. Representation, not just by the exercise of the right to vote, which is so precious and sacred in this country, and for many, many, many years it was denied to so many people, whether it was denied to women or people of color, and it's not fully realized even in this country in 2020, which is remarkable. So removing the barriers to political injustice through the voting system, I think it's very important to work on voting in people who have a mindset to achieve absolute justice for all people, to ensure adequate representation of people of color at every level of government. And I don't just mean in, in Congress. I mean every level of government, from county, city, state, to ensure those perspectives are heard, accounted for, and those people should be in positions of leadership so that they can educate um, others, including the majority of the country, as to what these injustices are. I think that's very important. So representation matters, democratic movement matters, democratic participation matters. Very well said. Well, you know, Amjid, we, we certainly do appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, I think there's you know, these are conversations that we must have, and, and it's it's really great to get um, your perspective as as well as, you know, having heard, um, you know, the responses that um, the community has done and, and, and where we're going. So we appreciate you coming on the show. 
Um, and we wish you peace and hope to talk to you again soon.